Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're going to start this evening in verse 8. Uh, this was about where we stopped last, uh, no, last class, two weeks ago. And then we get down to verse 10. Okay, so um, Solomon, as Solomon has been writing regarding the authority of the king, making sure that we respect that authority, it mirrors Romans chapter 13 perfectly, the way Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit to uh, to act as citizens in this world of different governments, uh, we're to obey those governing authorities. They're there, supposed to be there for, for, uh, to protect us and to protect those who do good. Uh, as Solomon has gone down, he's described, starting in verse uh, 6, every matter there's time and a judgment. You need to pick and choose your battles. Uh, verse 7, he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur? No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war, and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. This was uh, verse 8. It's about where we left off uh, last class. And Solomon's recognizing kind of the political landscape, the society in which you live, and some of the perhaps wrongs that you see, the evils that we see. There are things that we can do, and there's things that we can't do. And what Solomon describes is, in the end, it's all going to pass. Everyone faces death. The king's going to face death, just like the, the peasant, the commoner. Everyone faces death. And in verse 8, when he says, no one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. We don't have control when that time comes for our bodies to give up. Uh, as Jesus was on the cross and the, the New Testament says, he gave up the spirit or gave up the ghost. Uh, that his body died. Well, there's no power that you and I have over the body to be able to retain our, our life. We can't do that. No one has power in the day of death. Wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. Uh, two different ways in which th this is taken. Wickedness in the sense that those who are given to do wickedness, uh, certainly those who trust in their lifestyles and in the ways that they choose to do things that are contrary to God, those lifestyles, those choices, those paths will not deliver them uh, in the day of death. Uh, that, it's not going to deliver anybody. Uh, but wickedness is not going to deliver you. And if you trust in somebody other than God, there will be a double meaning to that. <laughs> there won't be any deliverance in the spiritual life either. Uh, but then also, uh, wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it in the sense that uh, those who have a tendency to commit wickedness, uh, I tend to think Solomon's referring to the former. They trust in their life, they trust in everything but God, they like the way they do things, and they uh, maybe even know, know that they're not supposed to be doing it, but they do it anyway. Verse 9, all this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his hurt. All right, so verse 9 is... Solomon is kind of taking a break for a moment from discussing the specifics of, of how to deal with the governing authorities and so forth. He mentions the king, and he says, all this I've seen, and I've observed all of these truths, that it doesn't matter if you're king or commoner, it doesn't matter if you're righteous or wicked, death is going to come to everyone. You can't fix everything in this life. There are going to be things you, you find in society and in your government that you don't like, but you have to pick and choose your battles. You have, to, you have to be very careful and wise in how you approach things. All this I've seen. I've applied my heart to every work. Remember before, he, he said, I applied my heart to what? Before, he's mentioned a couple of different things. I applied my heart to knowledge, to know, to know wisdom to seek out, chapter 7, to search. Remember we talked about the different times uh, through chapter 7, Solomon mentions searching or seeking out to find. Uh, now he says, every, I applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. Which is to say, not, not that he did every work so much as he wanted to understand every work. That it's not just about wisdom and it's not just about, about the idea of, of knowledge, book smarts we might call it, he wants to understand every work that is done under the sun. And really, in the end, when you kind of put all these different pieces together that Solomon says, I want to learn, I want to know, and I sought out, he's wanting to know the nature of man. He says, there is a time in which one man rules over another 
to his hurt, to his own hurt. He's not talking about the one who's being ruled. He's talking about the ruler. Now, how can that be so? In what way does Solomon say, what does that mean? That there is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. Is he talking about the king? So, so why would Solomon say that? In the, I think this is the NIV, all this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Uh, the way he, uh, or the way uh, Garrett here talks about this, I think this is interesting. He says an alternative translation of verses 9 and 10 is as follows. All this I have seen and have given attention to every deed under the sun, while man rules men to their own. To their hurt. To their, while well, man rules men. And of course, we've talked before about uh, the term, you know, where we get our, where, where the name Adam comes from in the Hebrew. And it means, the, the base root of it is red dirt. This is what man is. And, and so Solomon, when he says this, he's literally saying, red dirt rules red dirt. But the idea that he's pr- pr- uh, putting forward here is, there are times in which these rulers are doing so to their own detriment. What case is that? We, we've talked about this on numerous occasions. I mentioned it uh, on several occasions, especially regarding why it's good that governments and kingdoms don't persecute or outlaw good characteristics, righteous characteristics. Why is that? Why is it good for a government or a kingdom to not persecute good characteristics in people, for people with, that have good characteristics? Okay. If you are, and, and, and uh, Doug can relate to this, if you are an employer, Okay. Would you rather hire someone who you know you can trust, or would you rather hire someone who has a history of betraying trust? Common sense, right? You would rather hire someone you can trust, that you, maybe they're a member of the church, maybe it's somebody you've known all your life, somebody you've grown up with, whatever, somebody whose family you know, who can vouch for them, something along that lines, because you know their background and you know that they will be an asset to your business. Okay, they'll be helpful, as opposed to these evil characteristics, whether it's a, a business or a kingdom or a government, a country, evil characteristics has a tendency to be self-destructive, doesn't it? Okay, is murder a good thing to want to have in a kingdom? Is that, that going to uh, contribute to a healthy, prosperous society? Okay. Is stealing going to be healthy to a prosperous society? Evil characteristics are not going to contribute to a good society. Good characteristics will. And this is why in Romans chapter 13, Paul describes this as, uh, this is what God has intended for the governments of man to be able to protect these types of people who have these characteristics. That's why it's important for us to live what we preach and what we believe. But Solomon says that there is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. What happens sometimes? Remember we said it's a generality, that this is what God intended for man, but does man always do that? Have there been times where governments and societies have persecuted people with praiseworthy characteristics? Have there been times where these people with these types of characteristics that are an asset and that are a benefit to a society have been either killed or pushed out of that country? This is what Solomon is describing in verse 9. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. There are times where the king does things that are stupid. That's just the bottom line. The king does things he rules over, and how he rules his people can hurt himself. He's so nearsighted, he doesn't see far enough ahead to understand that the very characteristics, especially of the righteous, that benefit society... 
If he is against those things, he's only going to endorse negative and bad characteristics in his society, and that is not going to be helpful for his kingdom. That's going to actually be a detriment. Neil. You know. I mean, although we are law-abiding citizens as Christians, our speech isn't always as pleasant to, to certain liberal people. Um, the mayor of Houston uh, put out a executive order or whatever it was saying that any sermon yep. about homosexuality should be sent to her office and there was all kinds of, yep. everybody kind of laughed and you know played along but they just knew there was no teeth behind it but I mean there will be so there could be persecution over freedom of speech absolutely Absolutely. Yeah, I remember uh, reading all about that when I had just moved to South Carolina when uh, the Houston mayor had decided to do that. And all, all sermons had to be submitted basically for review. And anything that was considered hate speech would be persecuted. Prosecu prosecuted, same thing, persecuted too. Uh, but the idea being that all of those characteristics that go to what God's word has to say and that emphasize good pure, holy characteristics. In that example, this individual with authority decided she didn't like that. Uh, and so she was going to try to root it out of society. And of course, you know, that certainly lends to our free speech. Free speech is a right we have under the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. And as a result, we trust in the fact that our government will continue to uphold that. However, there may come a day when our government no longer upholds those basic fundamental values and, and freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, ironically, here we're coming up to July 4th here soon, uh, so it's certainly applicable. Anything, uh, anything else through verse 9? Yes, sir. Like so many examples of the Old Testament where that Rehoboam himself, <clears throat> the way he ruled the people. Who now? Rehoboam. Oh, re oh yeah, Rehoboam. Taxation of yep. people led to him basically losing the vast majority yep. of his kingdom. That's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Rehoboam's a great example because ultimately, you know, Rehoboam chose to side with his people that his, of his age, okay, of like mind to him, not his father's advisors. But really, when you kind of boil it down, what would cause him to react that way? It had to be ego, okay? I, I'm going to assert myself. I'm going to prove I'm a king, and I'm going to put my, my thumb on you, my, uh, my power down, my foot down, and I'm going to make you do this. And, of course, the people didn't like that, and that's why the kingdom split. Okay, you had Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And after that, I mean, the history of Israel was never the same after that. Yes, ma'am. Two things came to mind for me. Uh, Pharaoh at the time of Moses and Hitler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great point. Yeah, Pharaoh, uh, certainly, he didn't uh, believe in Jehovah. He didn't, uh, didn't respect Jehovah's people, didn't respect Jehovah's power. And, of course, that was his ultimate downfall. Uh, and, of course, yeah, you know, Hitler, he, the Jews, uh, generally speaking, many of the Jews have uh, praiseworthy characteristics. You know, there are things that they're taught in the Old Testament that are good characteristics. And Hitler, Hitler he, uh, he saw it, of course, he was extremely racist. It wasn't just Jews that he persecuted. A lot of people don't think about that. But there was a lot of different people he persecuted uh, and, and had killed. But, yeah, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You know, he ended up on his own. To his detriment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to the destruction not only of his, of his uh, power, but his country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and this, this goes to show that Solomon understood, you know, there is a, for, in general, wise rulers understand that good characteristics are important to nurture and protect, not to persecute. But there are times when these rulers take advantage of their positions, they get on an ego trip, a power trip, they're crazy, whatever, and they decide they just want to do what they want to do, and they don't have the foresight, the wisdom to think ahead and think about how this is going to affect my country in the long run. And he's absolutely right. We know of many examples in our history uh, and even today where this is true in, in countries around the world. Anything else through verse 9? All right. Verse 10, Then I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. 
because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. It's interesting, verse 10. <laughs> when I was looking up to study here, verse 10, this term forgotten, you'll see that little italicized A here. It, in certain manuscripts, it, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for forgotten and for praised are very similar. And so in uh, certain versions, it says forgotten, and I think it's in the American Standard, it says praised. And <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's a little uh, counter, uh, counterproductive because those are two completely opposite things, really. Praised is kind of the epitome of not being forgotten. But I, I want to read you uh, what, what Garrett says uh, in this case, because he translates this also. Uh, in, such, in such circumstances, I saw the wicked buried. So he's connecting it to verse 9. I don't know that it has to be, that, but this is how he's connecting it. I saw the wicked buried, and people came and attended the funeral, and the wicked were praised in the city where they had behaved in this manner, wickedly. This, too, is absurd. Uh, let's see. He says... Uh, with verse 11, this means that in spite of a notorious reputation, the wicked achieve prosperity and come to an end that is at least officially honorable. The fact that they achieved such success in life in spite of and indeed because of their oppression of others encourages people to follow in their path. Verse 9 also brings out the irony of oppression. Uh, Adam, that's red dirt ultimately, rules red dirt. The use of Adam brings out both the unity and sinfulness of the race, as well as the tragedy that they are under human rather than divine government. Uh, so I kind of thought that was interesting because he, he looks at this as being praised. And it does make, make sense in the context that that would be vanity. Okay? Even when they are wicked, and, and of course whether he's talking about wicked rulers, that certainly applies in the context of verse 9, or wicked in general. Okay, this really can be a, a much broader application. Who had come and gone, notice this, from the place of holiness. What does that mean, from the place of holiness? They had come and gone, back and forth, back and forth, from the place of holiness. The temple, yeah. And I found this a really interesting note. Garrett doesn't say anything about it, but I find it interesting because here in verse 10, he's describing wicked people who at least pretended outwardly to show respect to God and to offer their sacrifices and to follow the law. They came, they went, and went out, came into the place of holiness, and let's, let's go with praise for a minute. I'm going to look at this both ways. They were, and they were praised in the city where they had so done, where they were basically hypocrites. And were really, ultimately, the people there probably knew it, you would think. Okay, you can put on a, a, a righteous exterior, but ultimately, if you live somewhere long enough, people see both your, the best of you and the worst of you. And they saw the wicked buried, despite having been outwardly trying to look like they're righteous, and there they were praised in the city where they had so done. This is vanity. Okay, it's pointless. Just because they may have died being praised, is that really the praise we're seeking or should be seeking? No, it doesn't matter if we're praised or if we're mourned or if nobody comes to our funeral at all. It, what ultimately matters is our place with God. Okay, so that, that's the praised aspect of it, and it fits. However, later here in chapter 8 and into chapter 9, Forgotten is going to be an important part, people being forgotten and forgetting those people that have come before and the mistakes that they've made. And so I, I, I think praise fits, okay? But I think an equal case can be made for forgotten also fitting. Because when he says they were forgotten in the city where they had so done, this also is vanity from the sense that they were forgotten in that city. All of their... All of their going back and forth to the place of holiness, everything they tried to do for themselves, the name they attempted to make for themselves, perhaps by wicked means, the, the means by which they got to their position of power or their wealth or whatever wickedness they were involved in, in the end, they're gone. And that's one of the points he's going to make later in chapter 8. You're dead. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can change about the situation. So where did your wickedness get you? It got you forgotten. <laughs> It didn't get you remembered. And in a lot of ways, one of man's 
I guess, kind of deeper psychological fears of death, it's not just dying and not being here anymore. It's not leaving behind a legacy, leaving behind a memory, being remembered, being looked upon favorably, uh, being considered uh, worthwhile in their community or in their society. You know, we think about the founding fathers of our country and how their names have gone forward for the last almost 250 years or so. A lot of most of those men were simple farmers, simple people who came to the, to the new world to escape persecution from England. Okay? Many of them weren't necessarily wealthy, okay? and they weren't necessarily aristocratic. They just sought a better life. I would venture to guess that they would be shocked and amazed that their names, many of them anyway, are still commonplace, common names to be spoken. But 250 years later, their names were still synonymous with the revolution, with the establishment of the United States of America. I imagine they would be shocked. I imagine that most of them would probably be honored, certainly, but I bet most of them probably didn't anticipate that happening. See, some people, here's a, actually, it's not a Star Trek quote, but it, I know it because it's a Star Trek quote, but Worf quoted it from somebody else. Some men seek greatness. Others have greatness thrust upon them. Because they're not, they're not seeking that, but they are good leaders anyway. Or, or they, have, they fight for a worthy cause or whatever. And in that particular case, that's kind of interesting to me because people who sometimes don't really want to be remembered, sometimes because of the incredible things that they do, they are remembered. Maybe not by an entire nation or society, but by the people in their lives because they were humble. Because they were uh, aware and somber uh, of their, what they were doing, of their example. Whereas the people who seek to be remembered, that's all they want is to be remembered and leave behind a legacy. Oftentimes, they do that to the end, or the, the, the means by which they get to that end, the means are wicked. And as a result, a lot of times, what's left behind isn't so much the legacy that they wanted, it's the wickedness that they leave behind. And so forgotten, I think, fits just as well as praised. You were forgotten all the same. <laughs> what did it do? What good did it do you? Yes, sir. You see that a lot in the military. Do you? Yeah, having the ulterior motives. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then, you know, there's a saying that, uh, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? And, and that concept, I think, is very important to remember that no matter how the best of intentions some of us may have in the things that we seek to do, when it comes to having authority over others, if you're in that position, employer certainly fits in that category, but if you're in a position of authority, if you're in a position where people listen to you, they have to listen to you maybe because it's their job, be careful with the example that you set and with your attitude and your mind because just a little bit of power, if we're not careful, can really go to your head and ultimately cause us to fall into the same trap these individuals did. Yes, ma'am. Right. Add, but when, when it's been that way for 50 years, that you've always had certain people live in Jerusalem. Kind of have an elitist it, type of. How it started. Yeah. So, in essence, forgotten. Right. And then praised because they're going in and out. I mean, yeah, that's it right. makes sense. And, yeah. You know, Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think both would be true, whether, whether Solomon intended it to be understood as forgotten or praised, either way. Uh, Either both both of them fit into the context or into the, the thought process that's being considered here. Both have lessons, applicable lessons that certainly are 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 backed up in other places. Yeah. Anything else through verse ten? Verse eleven. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. There's a, a similar proverb, uh, we talked about it a couple weeks ago when we talked about Father's Day, and we talked about the disciplining of, of sons in the case that Solomon references. And, he's, he, and I can't remember the exact uh, verse. He, he mentions the fact that uh, correct your child speedily, 
lest, lest something, lest. Anyway, the idea was that if you discipline your child immediately or, or speedily, he'll understand what it's about. Whereas if you wait and do it later, you, you might forget or the child will completely forget why you, he was being disciplined. Somebody, if you find that verse, read it so I can not feel bad for butchering it. Uh, so verse 11, but that, that's kind of the concept here as well. Okay, but except in this case, in verse 11, this tends to be more of a, I look at this more of a, as a physical type of sentence. It can apply to spiritual sentences as well, but I don't, we need to be careful because a lot of times people read this and they think of this as God's sentence upon evil. Well, I understand that, that because God is long-suffering, Man gets very comfortable in what he does. There's not an immediate bolt of lightning that strikes when you do something wrong. But God intended it that way under the present time so that man can make his own choice. And the ultimate judgment will be that moment. And there won't be any going back. But we have to be careful. If we say that, that Solomon is describing here a spiritual sentence, Solomon in many ways almost says this as if this is a bad thing. Well, the fact that God isn't striking people dead whenever they do something wrong, whenever they sin, is not a bad thing, okay? It may create or instill in people the defiance to continue doing bad. But God not striking people dead for sinning immediately is not a bad thing. The way Solomon says this, he says that this is kind of just, this is a fact of life. And I tend to think of this more in terms of, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed, that is not the type of spiritual language that Solomon typically reserves for talking about God and about judgment, this is more of a governmental type of, of, of regulation type of situation. Certainly it's true, yes, that because there's not a, a, a uh, spiritual ramification or immediate spiritual ramification, uh, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase that, and not an immediate physical ramification for a spiritual sin, put it that way, because there is a spiritual ramification for sin, but not a physical, immediate physical sentence. That, that's, that's not God's, not, it's not that God's being foolish or that it's not wise of God to do that or whatever. It, God's doing that to let man have his own free will. I saw a hand somewhere over here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, it's a contrast. It, well, and it, yes, it is. And it has been proven to be a deterrent. Yeah. Yeah, punishment is definitely a deterrent. And if people know they're only going to get a slap on the wrist or they're going to be taken care of by the state for the rest of their lives, you know, I'm not advocating any type of political position or, or policy or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, if they kind of get to slide through and do what they want to and then the punishment isn't really that big of a deal to them, there is no incentive or, or, or uh, uh, what's the deterrent? Thank you. Uh, there's no real deterrent from keep them from doing evil. Yes, sir. Maybe the verse you're looking for is Proverbs 13, 24. He that spares his right hates his child. He that loves him chastens him times or promptly. Promptly. Okay, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, if you're, I mean, it, there's just certain things you don't play in certain countries with certain things because yeah. the consequences are swift and immediate. Yeah. And people don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think it's important to note that when Solomon says this, of course, he's basing this back from verse 10. And, and you know, really, in a lot of ways, this is all kind of a from a society governmental type of view anyway. Our place in society and how we handle these things and how we when we observe people whether they were leaders or just people maybe who were wealthy or whatever but they were wicked but maybe they talked a good game maybe they tried to make it look like they were righteous or, or, or holy or whatever and in the end it doesn't do them any good they can't escape death no one else can 
because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. <laughs> can you imagine, and again, I'm not getting political here, but can you imagine a society, our society, where instead of having, not, not that we remove due process or anything else, but instead of having years of a trial, that it all takes place in four weeks. Can you imagine? That you are, that all the discovery, everything, the trial and the sentencing and the execution of that sentence all takes place within four weeks. It makes me wonder, okay, would that be a deterrent too? Because Solomon's specifically emphasizing not just the nature of the sentence, but the speed of the sentence. If people know it's going to be in legal limbo for years, eh, I'll deal with it. You know, future Michael will deal with that. You know, right now, I'm just going to do what I want. And so Solomon, when he describes this, it certainly it falls in line with the disciplining of children because we want our children to understand what you did was not, was not good, and I don't want you to think that it was okay or that you can get away with it. Well, now take that in a much broader uh, society level. This is what Solomon is describing here in verse 11, that if an evil work were sentenced speedily, it might, wouldn't be so uh, nice of a thing to think about. That's why he says, therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them, in them, to do evil. Anything else through verse 11? Yes, sir. At the beginning of the last verse, it says, this is also vanity. Everything he's doing when he says that, everything he's talking about is the physical side. Right, absolutely. The things of this world. And that's what this whole thing is about, is what he is seeing happen in the world that people get caught up into. And then at the very end, he says, the real thing is the fear of God. And that yeah. Because all of the things that we've been looking at is all empty, vanity, a waste of time. And I, I, people that do evil look for what they can get away with. Yeah. You know, and it, it probably changes from well, the, the cops are cr cracking down on this, so I'll, I'll do something else. Yeah. You know? When their heart is set on doing evil, they're going to look for ways, and when our government gets lax, and, and not necessarily it's anybody's fault, but it happens. Yeah. They get lax on something, and that's where the evil goes to. Because they can get, they think they can get away with it. Because they are evil. He doesn't talk about a specific thing. He says evil. Yeah. Right? That covers everything sure. that's wrong. Yeah. Well, they they go towards the area where they can get away with it right. until that's covered up, and then they'll look in another direction. And he sees that, and it's because... There's no punishment for it in this world. People do it and get away with it. Eventually, they won't get away with it. We know yeah. that. Fear God and keep His commandments right. is what we, we really need to realize and focus on. Then all these physical things will take care of themselves. And we, you know, if we're fearing God, we're, we're the people who don't have to worry about it. Right. At least shouldn't have to. Shouldn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when you were talking, what occurred to me, what is the motivation for an individual to do something unlawful if it has nothing to do with spiritual or, or you know, personal conviction type of things, but because they want to do it? What, what, what's, the, what's the ultimate bottom line to that? What do you think the motivation is? I mean, obviously, other than because they want to. Somebody wants to go steal something. Somebody wants to... In particular, when we were driving home from uh, Arizona, there was a, a, a truck. We were doing, you know, the, the speed limit 75, and this truck had to be doing 90. Okay, well, on Google Maps now, they have these things that show you where the speed traps are. Well, we were coming up to a speed trap, and all of a sudden, I saw that truck slow down. There wasn't a cop there. The speed trap, he caught somebody else or something. But the speed trap wasn't there. But I knew as soon as I saw that, I started looking around for a police officer. I said, I knew I, he's using Google Maps just like I am. Of course, I wasn't speeding, but this dude was doing 90. And I got to thinking about it. I said, why would you slow down if you think there's a cop there? Well, first of all, you know you're doing something you're not supposed to because you could get caught and get a ticket. And that's what he didn't want. So why was he doing it in the first place? Because he could get away with it. <laughs> okay, because he could get away with it? He wanted to get where he's going. Want to get to where he's going? But he knows it's wrong. He slowed down for the speed trap. Why did he do it if he knew it was wrong? He didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't care. And this is something that 
our society, it, it, we're seeing it, we've seen it really off and on since the 60s in different ways. But really, ultimately, mankind as a whole has an issue with authority. And the, the, def the, the defiance, the, the desire to not be ruled or governed, to be able to do what I want, and you can't tell me I can't, in many ways, this is mirrored when it comes to spiritual issues too. I mean, how many times have you talked to somebody or maybe brought up something about the Bible and they don't really want to listen because God's telling them, in essence, what they're doing they shouldn't be doing, and they don't like that. And they want to continue doing what they're doing. Okay, there is this, there's a kernel of rebellion, of defiance, of pride, uh, of a desire to, to fight against authority that has existed in man since Adam and Eve. And Solomon, in many ways, kind of approaches that. He deals with some of this because Christians are supposed to submit to the governing authorities, aren't we? Okay? That means there isn't it to be any, any defiance or, or rebellion against authority within us unless the case is that they're commanding us to break a commandment of God. Okay? But that's not defiance. That's commitment to serving God. Okay? But isn't the, same, I mean, doesn't, isn't, isn't the same parallel come over to the spiritual realm too? That when we know something's wrong, God's not going to strike me dead right now so I can get away with it and I'll pray for it later. That is a mindset that sometimes Christians get inside their heads. It's like a get out of, free, uh, out of jail free card. You know, I'll pray for forgiveness afterwards. You know, and I'll be sorry then. But he's not going to strike me dead so I'll be able to get away with it. I can do what I want. And there are those who claim to be Christians who kind of use that as a means of loopholing God and his will. Ultimately because we want what we want. And in some cases, and more so than in others, there is this resistance to authority. And so because an authority said don't do it, what do I want to do? I want to do it. Apparently, I, I, don't, I don't know this for a fact, but mom says that's the way I was when I was a kid. You know, she said, don't do it, and I'd, I'd creep over, creep over. She smacked my hand. i creep over. She said, you'd had to do it one more time after I told you not to. You'd had to do it one more time. Just, it was like I just had to do it, even though I knew I was going to get, you know, my hand smacked for it. I had to do it. It was like that just desire, you told me not to, so I have to. And there are different people who kind of have that tendency, because you tell me not to, and now I have to do it. I want to do it now. I, I wouldn't have had a problem if you hadn't said anything, but now I want to do it, because you told me not to. Yes, ma'am. What, you're, what, you're, what you need, yep, yep. It's a very self-centered society, yeah. And it's not just like us, uh, everyday people, it goes through to the top. Sure, sure, yeah. You know, I mean, there are, and, and to be fair, there are still good people in, in our society and many other societies. You know, we know that from the charity, you know, that is put in, of course, <laughs> I've asked myself the question before, if all the tax incentives get taken away from charity, would the charity still be there? And I would highly doubt that the majority of the charity would still be there, but still, we have generous people. There are generous people who exist in our society. And, but it seems like more and more, maybe it's just because we have access to, in, on the moment, in the second news, it seems like more and more we're being exposed to people who are so self-centered that they do something like somebody who got cut off. I don't know if you read about that article. Somebody was driving, they got cut off in road rage. They got out of the stoplight and shot both people in the car because they got cut off. Who does that? But yet, more and more we're seeing that because you made me angry, therefore I can't control myself. All right, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll pick up with verse 11 and 12 next Wednesday night.